There are new tensions between the U.S. and North Korea as Pyongyang launches short-range missile tests for the second time in less than a week. I'm Laura Podesta. I'll tell you how President Trump is starting to lose faith in Kim Jong-un's willingness to denuclearize. The Missouri River Drug Task Force is working against the tide to curb the drug epidemic across Gallatin County and beyond. I'm Cody Boyer with how that epidemic is growing. Good morning to you. 6.30 on the dot here on your Friday and welcome to it. Chet Lehman, Missy O'Malley with you here and Matt Elwell has our gorgeous Mother's Day weekend yes, forecast in just a moment. We're all in a very good mood. Yes, we Here's are. Here's our top story for you now. For the second time in less than a week, North Korea fired off short-range missiles. They are the first launch by the communist nation in more than a year and may be due to a growing frustration over negotiations with the U.S. for sanctions relief. CBS's Laura Podesta has the latest. North Korea says yesterday's launch is nothing more than routine military training. The short-range ballistic missiles lifted off near Pyongyang and splashed down in the Sea of Japan. North Korean state media reported that Kim Jong-un stressed the need to further increase the capability of the defense units to cope with any emergency. <laughs> South Korean President Moon Jae-in says the tests are likely in reaction to the failed Hanoi summit between Kim and President Trump. It's an honor to be with Chairman Kim. North Korea was looking for sanctions relief, but would not fully denuclearize. We couldn't give up all of the sanctions for that. It's the second launch in less than a week after going more than a year without any tests. President Trump was still optimistic after the first, tweeting Kim knows that I'm with him. Deal will happen. Nobody's happy about it. Yesterday, he began to express some doubt. The relationship continues, uh, but we'll see what happens. I know they want to negotiate. They're talking about negotiating, but I don't think they're ready to negotiate. Sanctions are meant to deprive Kim of the money and equipment needed to build nuclear weapons, and violating them will not be tolerated. After yesterday's launch, the Justice Department announced it seized a North Korea freighter last year that was caught disobeying the embargo against selling coal on the world market. Laura Podesta, CBS News. Now, experts say the missile was identical to the one the North launched on Saturday. Based on how far they traveled, they do not represent a new threat at this point. At this point. Matt joins us now. We were just saying a moment ago, we're so excited about the forecast this weekend. I want to play a game with you guys. Okay. 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 Uh, we're going to play a little trivia game. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have temperatures into the 70s, I want to ask this question. Mm -hmm. When was the last time that we had temperatures in the 70s? Um, uh, okay, let me give you September <laughs> 1994. <laughs> okay, 21 days, 64 days, 181 or 129 days. 129. Uh, at least that, yeah. This I'll go 181. I'll go 181. This will surprise you. The answer is 21 oh, days. Oh, 21 days. I was wondering because uh, in April was, we did hit we did. something kind of yeah. nice. Okay, Bermuda okay, Airport okay. hit 72, 77. So. I was going to say 21 days. What day of the week? Did I nap through that day? <laughs> uh, was I not have. here on the 19th? That's you a possibility. Was that a Thursday? <laughs> you know what? That was right before Pond Skin Weekend. I do remember that. Yeah. It, yep, was, yep, 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 it was yep, a yep. Thursday, wasn't it? And then winter came back. Trick question. What if I had a viewer send in that question. Okay, well, thank you. When was the last time? And I honestly... And then it was 1997 before <laughs> that. Right. It, was. it was actually Christmas. It was really warm around. Uh, I'm going to move on so we don't <laughs> run out of time. Temperatures holding into the 60s for the afternoon. There is a chance of some afternoon thunder showers as you head later into the day. We do have the uh, nice weekend ahead, but showers next week. We're going to break it all down in just a few minutes. <laughs> Sounds good. Now we all learned something. It's yes, 633 here on your Friday morning. Our top local story for you. The drug epidemic from meth and heroin to prescription drugs and opioids continues to rise across the country. Yeah, teams like the Missouri River Drug Task Force go undercover to try to stop it. MTN's Cody Boyer yesterday met with task force members and has more details. We're here for our communities. We're here for all the seven counties that we, uh, we work in. It's a scourge that has been labeled an epidemic across the entire United States. Commander Ryan Stratman of the Missouri Drug Task Force says having dangerous drugs like methamphetamine is almost never the only crime. A lot of these crimes that we estimate in the 90 percentile of the crimes committed revolve around drugs and alcohol. When it comes to stopping the worst, Commander Stratman's undercover officers are the first to investigate. These are long, complex investigations uh, with multiple individuals involved. They're hard workers and, and they they take this job on and they take it seriously. 
The officers say the drug epidemic applies to many drugs, including opioids, marijuana, meth, and heroin. According to the task force, the concern with marijuana lies in the THC level. Back in the 90s, they say the drug used to have 7%. Today, bump that up to 30 to 40%, with marijuana products like wax and shatter bumping up to 90%. With meth, though, they say the concern is steeper, as it has become easier to purchase. The task force says seven years ago, a gram cost cost about $180. Looking at today, three and a half grams could have a street cost of $50 to $80. And while labs are less prevalent, 90 to 95 percent comes from Mexico. The task force says prescription drugs are also a big problem and they're easy to get, so boxes like these are very useful. Still, when it comes to the overall drug epidemic, they say meth is the larger issue. Our number one drug that we investigate is methamphetamine. And as the task force hopes, some public education that can make a difference in Montana. When you hear of the opioid crisis or you hear of a drug epidemic or you hear of methamphetamine, now you have some understanding of what the task force is and what they do. In Bozeman, Cody Boyer, MTN News. Uh, here's an important note as well. The commander adds that any report of suspicious activity from you, the public, can also go a long way to help their mission. You can find out how to contact the Missouri River Drug Task Force by visiting our websites. A lot of good information Absolutely there. Absolutely true. Now, officials with the city of Bozeman and Gallatin County have met to discuss problems with the current 911 dispatch center. This comes after Bozeman emergency officials brought up concerns with 911 response times to the county. The county initially responded that it was not interested in meeting with police or Bozeman fire unions to discuss the issue. County Administrator Jim Doerr says the meeting with Bozeman City Manager Andrea Surratt was productive and a start for future conversations and solutions for dispatch issues. It, it went well. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, I think the city and the county are trying hard to see each other's perspectives. Um, it's just going to take some ongoing conversations. So, uh, you know, I'll be meeting with her again here soon. Uh, we don't know how soon, though. A date and time has not been set for another meeting between the city and county to discuss this topic. And the group that wants to see the creek running through Butte again just got some strong support from congressional leaders. Now, the Restore Our Creek Coalition received support from Representative Greg Gianforte and Senator Steve Daines, both Republicans, and Democratic Senator John Tester. The group received written letters from them endorsing full restoration of the nearly mile-long portion of Silverbow Creek running through Butte. I'm proud that they've stepped forward and, and, and have said what needs to be done and, and what they really said is that the proposal that's been put forth by ARCO, BP, by the state, by the local government and the EPA is not a quality cleanup for our community. The Atlantic Richfield Company has suggested building a man-made creek through Butte, but this idea is not very popular. In other headlines, a highway safety meeting held yesterday at the Montana Department of Transportation in Helena. Traffic safety advocates met to discuss the dangers of being on roads during the summer season. Although compared to previous years, road fatalities have declined 20% to 33% during the meeting, or during the meeting, I should say, members of the community, including Highway Patrol and Health and Human Services, discussed the future for Montana drivers and how they plan to handle road safety during the coming summer. And we're coming together to uh, plot new strategies to uh, push the number to zero. So once in a while we get together, we work together, and uh, just see what everybody's doing and, and uh, remind them that what we are doing is effective and yet still very important to continue. And uh, unfortunately those numbers change very quickly. Since May 6th there has been a 15% increase with five fatal crashes in just one week alone. It's crazy. Yep. And state school officials gathered on Thursday afternoon to discuss school bus safety and the benefits of adding seat belts. Main speaker of the presentation was Tom Kahn, who is the transportation manager for the Helena Public School District, the first Montana school district to require seat belts on buses. He says that decision has already saved lives and showed video of a 2017 crash that he says could have been fatal if those students had not been buckled. He added that the problem with buses isn't that they are unsafe in general, but can be extremely unsafe in the event of a rollover. The age old problem with buses is this. Anytime a bus turns over, that's when we start having catastrophic injuries in buses. So the problem is, it's not so much that the buses aren't safe, it's when they get in a situation where they're out of their element. And that's 
Number one is a side impact or a rollover. It's a catastrophic injury for kids on buses. Now, while safety is the main advantage when installing seat belts into buses, Khan says it also helps bus drivers with crowd control. And May is Stroke Awareness Month, and when it comes to strokes, timing is everything. Stroke symptoms can be relatively painless if you do randomly experience loss of balance, trouble with vision, facial droop, losing balance, or feeling in one of your arms or on one side of your body, you need to see a doctor right away. Stroke is now the number five cause of death in the United States. The number one cause of it is disability, which is why getting to the emergency room as quick as you can saves much more than just your life. If you have these kind of symptoms, get in as quickly as you can. We'll sort out what the process is, um, however your symptoms transpire after the start. Getting here in time, being with us as we figure out what is going on is your best chance to have a good outcome if it does turn out to be a stroke. Now here's some helpful tips. Maintaining low blood pressure, a good body weight, diet and exercise can help you reduce your chances of having a stroke. Important to know the signs. It though. really is. And yep. There was a story even the other day of a, a guy cracking his neck and he ripped yep. some artery and yep. his father-in-law was right there and got him right to the yeah. hospital. Time is of the essence when we're talking about a stroke. Certainly. Sure. We do have to take a quick break.